I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. This week, you'll meet Dr. Evelyn Hooker. She was something else, a force of nature, even at 81. But you have to be a force of nature to do what she did when she did it. Back in 1953, Dr. Hooker started work on a first-of-its-kind psychological study that demonstrated gay men were no different from straight men when it came to their sanity. At that time, just about everyone thought gay people were mentally ill. Homosexuality was a sickness. Even most gay people believed it. And what do you do when you're sick? You try to get cured. And that's what a lot of gay people did. So they spent years and fortunes trying to get over an illness they didn't even have. The really unlucky ones were forced against their will into horrible treatments that were nothing short of torture. Lobotomy, chemical castration, and shock treatment. And I'm really not kidding. Those were the ways in which gay people were treated. This is a story about serendipity, a pivotal moment in history when a gay psychology student named Sam Fromm set his sights on Dr. Evelyn Hooker. He urged Dr. Hooker to do a study of normal gay people to show the world what they were really like. That was in 1945. And then life got in the way, and Dr. Hooker set aside Sam's project. You can read about this part of Dr. Hooker's life on our website, makinggayhistory.com. So now it's 1953, when Dr. Hooker gets back to her work. She found the men she needed, she gave them psychological tests, and then got top psychologists to review the results. When you hear Dr. Hooker talk about someone named Bruno, that's Dr. Bruno Klopfer, a German psychologist. He was one of the study's judges. So in August 1989, I fly out to Los Angeles and I drive my rented convertible, because it's Los Angeles, to Dr. Hooker's apartment in Santa Monica. It's just a couple of blocks from the beach. She welcomes me into her double height living room. Bookshelves reach to the ceiling. And I just about choke on the air. It's saturated with smoke and nicotine. And I'm thinking, please God, don't smoke through the whole interview. But she does. Before we sit down, Dr. Hooker shows me her small office. It's lined with cabinets filled with the files of the 60 men she studied. The contents of those cabinets change the course of history. We head back into the living room. Dr. Hooker leads the way, and she walks really slowly and deliberately. She's got spinal arthritis and gingerly lowers her six-foot frame into her high-backed leather easy chair. I clip the microphone to her blouse. She lights a cigarette and draws deeply, and I press record. Interview with Dr. Evelyn Hooker, Sunday, August 20th, 1989. Interviewer is Eric Marcus. Location is the home of Dr. Hooker in Los Angeles, California. They wanted us to come to dinner. We went to dinner. His lover was introduced as his cousin, a much older man, George. And <laughs> you wouldn't believe, since you didn't live then, you would not believe how gay men, they could put on a business suit, no humor. They were afraid to have me know that they, were, they wanted my approval so much that they were afraid to let me know that they were gay. Anyway, uh, delicious dinner, and uh, gradually they became very good friends. He still hadn't told you that he was gay? No indication. I don't even know. I, uh, oh, yes, gradually the facade came down because they thought that I didn't care what they were like. Mm -hmm. I liked them. I found them to be very interesting people came to be very fond of them. And I don't even remember a time when, and I'm sure there wasn't a time when somebody said, look, we're gay, now you better, right. <laughs> you know. There was nothing just, like that. It was just a very gradual letting down of air. After I'd known them about, I would say, about a year, we were invited by Sam and George to go with them on a uh, holiday, on Thanksgiving holiday to San Francisco. We get to San Francisco, and the first night or second night we're there, Sammy insists that we should go to Finocchio's. My eyes were wide. I'd never seen anything like that. What was Finocchio's like then? Oh, my God. Well, there were, uh, are they still there, the two old bags from Oakland? I don't, I don't know. Uh, okay. But for, for people who won't know what it is, right. can you just describe what the place was like? Well, uh, it was, of course, a tourist place. It was not really, it was not a gay bar. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, to be sure, they serve drinks. But it was essentially a tourist place for primarily, as I saw it at least, for transvestites or would-be transvestites or transsexuals. And of course, there, there, uh, it was altogether a, a different kind of world. <laughs> they had a lot of patter, uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. a female patter. 
they uh -huh. thought, and it was it was funny. It was. I'm sure they're dead by now, and that's yeah. a shame. They were they were great. I thought they were great. <laughs> so you went back to the Fairmont. We went back to the Fairmont. It sat down. We we're going to have a snack before we went to bed. Now, he said, "We have let you see us as we are, and it is now your scientific duty to make a study of people like us." Imagine that. And by people like us, he meant we don't, we don't need psychiatrists, we don't need psychologists, we're not insane, we're not any of those things they say we are. I said, but I couldn't, I couldn't study you because you're my friends, and I couldn't be objective about you. And to which he replied, mm, we can get you a hundred men, any number of men you want. You're the person to do it, you know us. And you have the training. But why would he want you to do a study? What was the purpose of doing a study about these? The purpose of doing a study was to show the world what we're really like. I could understand there was, ex there was, there was excitement about doing something that you felt was going to be groundbreaking, whatever happened, because it would have been the first time anybody ever looked at this behavior and said, now, we'll use scientific tests to determine, is this pathological or not? And all this time, everyone had said it was pathological Absolutely. without any studies. Without any studies. They represented, even in that relatively small group, they represented a, a cross-section of personality, of talent, of background, of uh, adjustment, of mental health. The whole kit and caboodle was there. So even by then, you knew that the current thinking was incorrect. But I had to prove it. Dr. Evelyn Hooker, tape two, side one. I had just heard that the National Institute of Mental Health had been founded. And I said to myself, gee, well, I think what I'll do is to apply to the National Institute of Mental Health. If they think this project is worth doing, if study section thinks this is worth doing, I'll do it. The chief of the grants division flew out and spent the day with me. He wanted to see what type of kook this was. Is she really crazy? or? Can she do this? At the end of the day, he said, I'll tell you we're prepared to make you this grant. I decided with the consultation with my statistical consultant, Dr. Gingerelli, that we would settle for a small group. There's 30, 30 in each group, 30 heterosexuals, 30 homosexuals. But the problem was getting the straight people, the straight men. Why? Well, remember, this is early 50s. I was just at my wit's end to find uh, people who were of the general educational, economic, etc. level of my gay group. And one day, I was sitting in the study, and I heard some steps coming down the driveway, and I looked out, and there were blue trousers legs, four of them, and I said, oh boy. And <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it turns out that, that they were firemen, and they were from our local fire department, and they were over, they were looking at uh, our fire precautions. So I walked over to talk to them. One of them said, uh, oh, you're a writer. And I said, well, no, not exactly. I'm a psychologist. Oh, he said, I have two boys, and they're in a psychology experiment at UCLA. And I said, oh, would you be willing to be in a psychology experiment? Oh, no, I couldn't do that, he said. I said, well, wait a minute. What about on your days off? And he said, well, then I have to take care of my boys. I said, what if I pay the babysitter? Finally, he broke down and said, okay. Uh, he introduced me to a cop. And did I learn about the ins and outs of the police department downtown? And he wanted to come to me because, it turns out, he was having marital trouble, and he hoped that he could exchange a little information for <laughs> Anyway. A oh, I tell you, there's nothing more interesting than human beings. Anyway, at that time, every clinical psychologist worth his salt would tell you that if he 
gave those projective techniques that he could tell whether a person was gay or not. No such thing. I showed they couldn't. When Bruno did the judging, and every, people said, you'll never get away with this. You know, you, he, your face will reveal it. You'll know. I said, oh, nonsense. Uh, anyway, and he's the great Rorschach expert, and every day, I think we spent 10 days just going over one after the other and one after the other. And, but that was, of course, it was terribly exciting to see Bruno, who said, you must let me know after, where I made the errors afterwards. And then he would say, oh, I knew, I knew there was something about that. I knew there was something about that. <laughs> and, 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 but the, the terribly exciting days, terribly mm -hmm. exciting days. See, I presented that paper at a meeting of the American Psychological Association in Chicago. Uh, the adjustment of the male over, male over homosexual. Right, okay. right. The air was electric. It was just electric. And of course, there, there were people, some, not too many, but there were some people who were saying, well, that, of course, that can't be right. And they set off to try to prove that I was crazy. The hardliners among the psychoanalysts, they would assume shoot me as look at me. Why was it so electric? Well, if you're challenging a long and commonly held position, and you know that there are thousands of lives at stake, I think everybody who, who uh, unless they were severely prejudiced, as well as the people are, uh, we know, uh, that uh, in general it was a very exciting, very exciting concept. What was the impact of your, of your study then, ultimately? That I had made it a respectable field of study. It started a whole spate of pieces of research by gay and straight psychologists alike who had the courage to do it after I had done it and who came up with bits and pieces of this formulation. What means most to me, I think, is, um, excuse me while I cry, if I went to a gathering of some kind, gay gathering of some kind, I was sure to have at least one person come up to me and say, I've wanted to meet you because I wanted to tell you what you saved me from. I'm thinking of a, of a woman, a young woman, who came up to me in a meeting and said that her parents, put, when they discovered that she was a lesbian, put her in a psychiatric hospital and that the standard procedure in that hospital was uh, electroshock but that her psychiatrist was familiar with my work and he was able to keep them from giving it to her. With tears showing down her face. I know that, well, <laughs> I know that wherever I go, whether I know it or not, that there are both men and women for whom my little bit of work and my caring enough to do it has made an enormous difference in their lives. So I feel that that's my monument. It's a hell of a monument. Yes, it is. When Dr. Hooker got back from the Chicago convention, she met up with a group of the gay men she interviewed for her study at an L.A. restaurant, and she shared the results with them. But one person who never knew the results was Sam Fromm, Dr. Hooker's friend. He's the one who urged her to do the study in the first place. He was killed in a car crash before the study was finished. The last time I talked with Dr. Hooker was in 1992. By then she had circulatory problems and she couldn't travel. So she missed the premiere of the documentary about her life at the Castro Theater. That's in the heart of San Francisco's gay community. But I was there. And as soon as I got home, I called Dr. Hooker with a full report about the audience's reaction. They gave it a standing ovation. That was for you, I told her. 
I can't remember what she said, uh, but I'll never forget the emotion in her voice. She was so thrilled and delighted. I wish she could have been there. I'd like to thank our executive producer, Sarah Burningham, our audio engineer, Casey Holford, and our talented composer, Fritz Myers. Thank you also to Hannah Moak, our social media guru, our webmaster, Jonathan dozier Ezel, and our head of research, Zachary Seltzer. We had production assistance from Jenna Weiss-Berman, whose commitment to this project made it possible. The Making Gay History podcast is a co-production of Pineapple Street Media, with assistance from the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division. Funding is provided by the Arcus Foundation, which is dedicated to the idea that people can live in harmony with one another and the natural world. Learn more about Arcus and its partners at arcusfoundation.org. And if you like what you've heard, please subscribe to the Making Gay History podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find all our episodes on our website at makinggayhistory.com. That's where you'll also find photos and really interesting background information on each of the people we feature. So long. Until next time. Sammy was pressing me hard, and so I said, well, I'll talk with Bruno about it. So I went to Bruno, I told Bruno about this, what I've told you, and he said, oh, jumped up, practically leaped out of his chair and said, you must do it, Evelyn, you must do it, he said. Uh, he is absolutely right. We don't know anything about people like him. The only ones we know about are the people who come to us as patients. And of course, many of them are very disturbed and pathological and so on, so on, so on, so on. You must do it, he said. So I said, okay, Bruno, I'll do it. <laughs>